This is the River Guides Oral History Project. It's September 17th, 1994, and we're here at National Canyon with Les Jones. Um, and this is part one of this deal. What we're doing with these things is we're doing these interviews, and I did I tell you about this yesterday? I, I've been telling, I've been having so many visits, I can't really remember. Yeah, you mentioned it. We're not exactly an interview. Well, we're, we just, we're doing these little interviews and maybe we'll make them into some kind of little video that we, you know, it'll probably take us about a year to ever get it together, but we'll make a little piece for everybody here. Yeah. And, and beyond that, we'll, um, the ultimate goal of this is that we just archive it, that, that we um, give copy, I'm going to give copies to the library and probably to the park service and, you know, whoever wants it for the historical sense. Um, but before we let it go, uh, We'll have this thing transcribed and make sure that uh, you know that we got our and send you a copy of the transcript. Make sure that it's all okay with you and that we got our story straight, and, uh, and then get you. Then you can sign off on it and stuff. Um, so for starters, I guess what I've been asking everybody to do is just kind of tell us who they are, just so the camera hears it, and then and then tell us a little bit about your background where you grew where you grew up and stuff and then how you came to to this country and to the rivers here okay real fast thumbnail sketch I began running rivers when I was 11 years old I guess I got my dad to move his ranch to the river bottoms on the Missouri River and uh, I walked to school a half mile to the river and rode across 300 yards in Missouri, leading my horse behind me, and uh, went on two miles to the schoolhouse. In the wintertime, we would frozen, and then spring and fall would be either rolling through the ice flows or staying at neighbor's ranch across the river for a week or two. From there, uh, I went through the University of Bozeman, and uh, a lot of engineering work back in Minneapolis and Manhattan and various places and came back west uh, in 1953 when my father died with the express purpose of uh, building uh, boats and uh, running rivers. My cousin Don Hatch in Bus Hatch came to see me one time and, and uh, got me involved with uh, my brother-in-law running through a dinosaur with the Sierra Club to oppose the dinosaur dam that was in the works. That dam, incidentally, the uh, Bureau of Reclamation were kicked out, so to speak, from dinosaur and uh, immediately took advantage of an opening to build a dam in, uh, on Lake Powell, as we now call it, the drowning out Glen Canyon. And the Sierra Club was resting on its laurels, so before they knew it, the dam was in the works. From there, it's a matter of, uh, I ran solo on cataract and before that however I'd noticed that when I'd run with the Sierra Club uh, the rapids all kind of run together as a blur and I couldn't remember in you know, all details well enough when I didn't have identification points so I started my scroll maps I didn't like the wind on the US geological map so I started building my scroll maps and uh, other people liked them, so during the years I sold about 20,000 scroll maps of the different western rivers. And uh, my first run was alone, uh, was cataract. I ran solo from Moab to Height in two days. And my mother and sister picked me up. I had a partner going to run with me the same fall, that was August of 53, 
Thanksgiving of 53, I came to run the Grand Canyon. My partner didn't show up, so I sold the Grand Canyon to Marble at that time, down to uh, Bright Angel. I cashed my boat on the roof of the shed there and came back in April to finish the run, fixed a few holes of squirrels that eat my boat deck. Went on through to Bedrock, where I met Bus Hatch as I had planned, because Don Hatch and I had uh, designed the first big pontoon commercially to run the uh, Grand Canyon. And uh, Don Harris and I figured that it, Bedrock would be the biggest hazard for it. But the oars they would have a difficult time pulling through fast enough in this point of the rock and the off that shallow beach. And sure enough, they sunk the boat on the head of the rock and I gave the rope up to the, I came up from my boat and gave the rope to the passengers and we pulled it and bottom split out. The boat popped to the surface, Smush Allen jumped in, went to the bottom of the rope, the river came up surprised, rode it into shore and uh, after a couple hours of fishing for sleeping bags and things, I patched the boat up with my patching gear and they ran it on through Lava Falls and everything in great shape. Boat was in service for 20 years afterwards. Other than that, uh, I ran a lot of Western Rivers later and sold a lot of maps. Uh, practically all, everything was sold because uh, difficult in those days to find somebody to run with. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Um, now, you, was your, your first trip was your first trip ever in '53 that solo trip through your cataract, or had you done had you run earlier with well, those other first, guys with with your cousins? With the Don the first trip that I ran uh, was Cataract Canyon solo. Yeah. You'd never run another river, or no. another Whitewater River. Well. I ran boats on the Sierra Club trip. I ran a 10-man down to Split Mountain and, and talked Bus in to let me uh, run one of his big pontoons with Smush Allen and Don Hatch was on the shore above Moonshine Rapid giving everybody directions and everybody was looking at Don Hatch except me and I was looking at that big rock coming up. And I said, Smush, we're gonna run over that cotton picking rock. Everybody knows the house rock and Moonshine. And, uh, I just straightened the cotton picking boat up and we straightened it up and ignored Don on the shore and went right over the rock. There's two twins, uh, kids in the front end and my brother-in-law was up there in the front end. And uh, as we went over, I figured, well, I was facing, pulling downstream. You know, I was facing downstream and so I, I sunk the oar in my guts and, and caught him under the back under the bar of the waterfall in order to punch through the back way. We punched through all right, but we broke one of the three inch oars. And Bus gave me a, a ribbon for that, so I decided I'd run my own, so I ran down through cataract. And, but my brother-in-law caught those two twins. They got thrown way up in the air, and he caught them when they came down, one in each arm. Quite a, quite a feat, he kept them from going overboard. Uh. So that Bus's business was just kind of taken off then, huh? Yeah, he, he ran me good for breaking his oar. He said, you should never put an oar in. If I hadn't put that oar in, it would still be in a hole. Um, put them both in, one of them busted. Well, when you said you were, this is a digression, but when you said Manhattan, was that New York, New yeah. York City? You were an engineer there? In the Metropolitan Life Building, up on the top floor, right under the pyramid. I'll be darned. Right at, uh, right by the Flatiron Building. That's a heck, that's a long ways from the canyon country, boy. That... Yeah, New York's a good place to visit, but not to live in. Yeah. Um, well, uh, back to the to dinosaur. Uh, 
what was the deal there? Hardly anybody knew about rivers, and then all of a sudden this fight kind of geared up. The uh, controversy over the dam helped, getting, helped get the whole uh, recreation aspect of river running going. And then uh, I pointed my maps in that direction toward conservation, naturally, and, and there was always conservation notices on every map I sent out. So that and the uh, Sierra Club uh, kind of helped get everything off the ground and then everybody else took over. Um, was it, what was it, was it the publicity that got everybody interested or what? It was the publicity of the national controversy over dinosaur that really got the recreation business and river running fielded. Well, and, and then you were, if you could elaborate a little bit on that, you were talking about how it felt pretty good to whip that dam out, and then they, and then this other one, you let your guard down. How, how'd that? I, I don't know. I, I guess I was one of the people let my guard down. I didn't realize what was going on. Sierra Club didn't either, and the uh, Bureau of Reclamation sure didn't want to know what was going on. First thing we knew, they was all set up, build a dam in Glen Canyon. Did you know even then that Glen Canyon was probably every bit as good as Dinosaur? Yes, uh, Glen Canyon, in fact, uh, in my opinion, was uh, certainly a... I can't remember the... Moki Mac uh, Ellingson was the... Uh, runner of Boy Scout trips through Glen Canyon for a number of years before that. And he really uh, fielded the operations for uh, scouting in Glen Canyon. And uh, there are a lot of things in the museum at Green River, Utah, that uh, carry on the memory of Moki Mac and his operation. Did you get down there through Glen, through the Glen before it got dammed? That was a funny thing. I just broken my leg the uh, fall before, and Otto ran into me on a motorcycle. He was drunk and hit and run type thing, and it healed up. And so I took this uh, group from Federal Heights Ward down through Glen Canyon. Was the first one to be fueled by a bus insured from one end to the other. Took them through, uh, left Friday night from Salt Lake and got back Monday evening, uh, having come through to uh, Lee's Ferry. And we didn't miss anything along the way. We even held Sunday services at Cane Creek. We went up to Rainbow Bridge. I had to head off a bunch of fleet-footed scouts from going up the wrong branch when we went into Rainbow Bridge. And then uh, that summer in June, uh, Don Hatch fielded a trip from Green River, Utah, through the Grand Canyon for Charlie Eggerts. And I ran with him to uh, Green River, Utah, and got out there and went and got married because Bruce Liam was with us. And he insisted on wrestling in the morning. Well, I loaded everything, all the heavy stuff and everything, you know, but uh, my leg was still a little bit sensitive. I said, okay, you can wrestle if you want, Bruce. Don't land on my leg. First thing Bruce did that morning in Rock Creek was he landed on my leg with his knee right on the brake practice. So I went over and set up in the boat and said, tell him I won't be to breakfast, Bruce. And so we ran on down. I got out. Then... Uh, Bruce and Clark Liam took the boats on through with Don and Bus to Lee's Ferry and Lowell Thomas called Don and Bus to go to the Pakistan and the Gilgad and uh, the Indus and the Gilgad in Pakistan. There they uh, upset and one of the photographers wasn't wearing his life preserver and he got drowned and lost a bunch of movie gear. And uh, Bus and Don were laying up on top of the cliff looking down into this gorge down there and 
let's see, where were we? Okay, uh, on the Glen. So you so you did do a couple trips in there and stuff, and then when it, when you heard they were going to build that dam, you know, how'd that make you feel? And and uh, how did you do? Did you keep doing trips until they built the dam? And and how was that? How was it watching the thing go in? Well, there was a double-barreled uh, thrust, I think, intentionally by the. Bureau of Reclamation, they threatened us with a dam in Marble Canyon. And so while we were putting all our force on the, uh, resisting the dam in Marble Canyon, which we did successfully, which may have only been a ploy to divert us from attacking them in Glen Canyon, they uh, set up Glen Canyon and started building it, essentially. Uh, you know, it's either, they put it as either this or that. Well, we successfully got them out of marble, but I think that was possibly only a ploy to Smoke screen to hide, hide your operations on fueling Glen Canyon Dam, which buried a whole host of treasures like Music Temple, Hidden Passage, and uh, so many others that I've forgotten that I can't name, plus a few uh, Indian ruins. And uh, a wonderful, long, beautiful canyon. So. We lost the battle. Yeah. Um, when you go, when you went, you know, your maps really are important. To, I, John Cross Jr. was talking, and it's amazing. I, I hear from just about all kinds of, of, you know, the pioneers that I know down here. Uh, that they everybody people just absolutely started and got through with the aid of your maps you know you always hear about yeah it was John Cross Jr. said it he said uh, you know I ran all these rivers down here and it was just me and Les Jones and and that and that wasn't that you were there with him but you were there with him in the form of him him carrying your map and uh, did you I'm curious to hear a little bit about how you'd go about making those maps, just kind of what they were like and, and, and the, what work you had to do to, to do it, just to get them straight and, and uh, to get them done. The online of the maps was taken from the, uh, either from aerial photographs and, and drawn artfully or traced directly from the contour maps of the U.S. Geological Survey, putting the river end to end instead of cut up in segments like uh, the USGS did in putting the north arrow to suit the map instead of just trying to keep everything oriented to the top of the paper so I could line the river out on a seven inch scroll strip and, and take it from one end to the other without having to run off the scroll and make as long a sections as I could of river before I bent it and then putting the profile of the river usually above it and sometimes below it to wherever it fit best. So that the fellows that bought my maps used to say, well, I just ran the profile, you know, they'd go so many miles and hit another rapid. There it was on the profile, so they quite often didn't even bother to look so much at the uh, plan as the profile. But I think the fun of running the rivers is See the pro see the plan too, and see where you, how the river bends, and where the side canyons are, and all that kind of thing. So anyway, that's the way the maps are built. Uh, I admire the patience of everybody. While we had to put them on paper for lack of mylar, then we put them on mylar, and that doubled the price because it's much more expensive. But it's the only way to go. So I'm looking for a new way to put them on. Uh, Mylar with uh, Xerox type operation, but I haven't found it yet uh, successfully so that the maps will be more permanent, not subject to light so much. But that's the story of the maps. Essentially, uh, they're available today, but I have never advertised them because uh, I plan on being away for a couple of years and I don't want people to be hanging fire for a map. But when I get back, I'll probably make them more public. Where are you going? Well, they keep dinging me to go on a mission for the LDS church. So my wife and I probably will.
Do you, do you, do you know where you'd, where you'd be going? I have no idea which direction I can. They'll send, it's just, they tell you where to go, is that? Well, they give you some ideas, but then uh, you're liable to go to Timbuktu where you select. Uh, um, well, when you were making the maps, w did you do most of the field work solo? Was it on those solo trips you were doing? Most of them were solo, yes. Uh, I did make a map or two from the direct information of uh, guides on the rivers that uh, w was made available to me, like the Rogue River. A guide up there, I can't even remember his name anymore, it was 30 years ago, gave me the information to make that map. Did a very good job of it, so that's been available, but I've never had a chance to get to Oregon that down in that region to run it. Uh -huh. But uh, uh, practically all the others I've run solo on my own. Uh, was that how come you started kayaking? I, I understand you've built some really interesting boats, and I'm curious about how uh, you came to design them, how, how those designs Well, the evolved. reason for those boats was my first boat that I bought was a canoe built like all canoes with ribs and uh, long thin pieces of wood and canvas over the outside and I armored it with aluminum around the Grand Canyon. But uh, canoes, even Grumman canoes, uh, which I did run for a number of years like down the Salmon, are, if they get pinned too much of a freight train for one man to move, so I designed a boat that wouldn't be. And that was an aluminum 19-inch beam, 17-foot long kayak with which I ran a Grand Canyon with Ulrich Martins. And that's, I built four of those type boats. The others were 16 feet long. Who was Ulrich Martins and, and how'd you get to know him and how'd that trip go? The race is over Salida. I met Ulrich. Uh, he won the race there and and uh, gave me a ride back from the end of the race to Salida, Salida town. And I thought that was very kind of him. And then I met him when I was with Walter Kirschbaum over in Carbondale. And uh, I wanted Walter to run the Grand Canyon with me in 63 and he couldn't. Ulrich was there and he said, I'd like to. So Ulrich and his black Labrador dog and his old car uh, came with me and we ran the Grand Canyon. He wanted to take the Labrador with him. He said, oh, he can run along the shore, you know. And these German people come over here and think, well, there's a little uh, town every so often along the way where you can buy some beer and your dog can run along the shore. I said, no way, I'll already take more Williams and we found a family to keep him there. And Ulrich uh, did an excellent job running through the canyon with me. His, his glass kayak and my aluminum, uh, we ran on a thousand second feet, the record uh, low water, which the dam held back for us. And uh, we ran everything but four or five rapids. Now that would have been 61 or two or something like that? It was that. October 63. Uh, so Ulrich Martins and Walter Kirschbaum, those guys were, and you, you guys are like the pioneer kayakers that ever were out here, it sounds like. Uh, I, th I think that, I'm not sure, Walter may have, uh, a year before that, ran through with Don Hatch supported, but certainly Ulrich run with a, his kayak was the first unsupported and one of the only unsupported uh, kayak runs through. He was on his own, I was on my own. We didn't have any support boats. What kind of stuff did you take with you for camping gear and food? Oh, I took heads of cabbage and and uh, wheat that I soaked up and beans that we cooked up. And one time the beans went bad and I was throwing them away. Or he said, don't throw those beans away. He said, I want those. He said, I like a little alcohol. So I gave him the beans and he got a little high. <laughs>
How many? How long was that trip? How many days was it? Uh, longer than I remembered. Uh, I told always. I said oh, we went through there about. That's about 20 years later. I said it took about a week. He said no way. 19 days. I said Ulrich, right, you're crazy. I looked back my photo record. and Ulrich was right. It took us 19 days. We uh, didn't try to run too fast. We just enjoyed the canyon. We could have got through it a couple of days sooner, but nevertheless, it's all waterfalls and everything uh, was up and we had rapids where no rapids ever were before, so it did take time. Yeah, 1,000 CFS, I can see, must have been a million rocks and a million drops. But it was very beautiful. I, I mean, it was the most beautiful and memorable trip I've made because so many beautiful rock formations were exposed, like in Hans. Uh, we come to Hans and I wouldn't, well, at Uncar first, there was a five foot fall all the way across the foot of the river, foot of the rapid. And uh, at Hans, we came to Hans and there was nothing but a forest of great big huge rocks, so high that we couldn't see over them. We walk around among them, you know, and it was strange, entirely strange. Ulrich went over and went through the right side of the rapid, and I went through the left side of the rapid. Just a little water trickling here and there for our boat to run in. I come up to one rock at the head of the rapid, and it was grated just like honeycomb cheese with uh, hard white uh, honeycombs just as sharp as a razor on the edge. If a boater ever got in contact with that thing, he'd lose some hide. But it was fantastic walking through Hans. I never seen anything like it. Uh, lava was a little bit like it, but not much. Lava was paved on the left side with a smooth sidewalk. Right over top of the uh, big waterfall on the left side. That was all paved over. Um. We capped at uh, Havasu also, and there was no Outwash there, it was all bare bedrock, and no sand whatsoever. We camped there, however, the bedrock had ledges we could camp on. I guess you didn't see anybody else that whole trip. No, we never ran into anyone. Now, was your True boat... True wilderness run. Your boat, uh, did you row it? Did you have oar locks, or did yeah. you use a double... I out outrigged oar locks, just like a, exactly like a rowing shell. How'd, so how'd that work? Was that pretty maneuverable? It worked great. I did uh, have a repair job at Serpentine. I picked up a nail out of a board at Serpentine and did a repair job. A riveter bolt came loose and got lost, and so I riveted that nail in. And it worked because it went down to the end of the canyon. Ulrich hitchhiked out with a float plane from the Bat Cave, and they had that seven-mile cable across the canyon yet. And running bat guano out on that cable, and I towed Ulrich's boat down to Pierce's Ferry, and there's great big swampy mud bank I had to cross to get into the lake, get across Lee Pierce's Ferry, and exploding mud and everything. I got into it towing Ulrich's boat and pulling both boats fast, and finally I said, No, no way. So I got in and pulled the oars, and I made one foot bending the oars as far as they almost broke. And so for 300 yards, I made one foot to the stroke, uh, standing right up out of my seat to pull those oars. And the next day, Ulrich came up and looked down there and he said, what made that big track out there? And I said, it looks just like a big old goonie bird walking along. I said, that was me rolling across the mud, Ulrich. He said, I don't believe it. <laughs> but the oarlocks worked, they were solid. Um. Did you take a lot of movies of that trip, or of all your trips? I already took uh, 35s, and I had a big 4 by 5 camera I packed in my boat, Graflex, a new one. And I took a number of slides of it too, but uh, naturally Ulrich out photoed me. And he was, uh, every time there was action, he was right there at the right time, at the right moment, with the right stuff to get to camera work done and he had a magnificent set of slides and I got my copy and that 
doctor in Berkeley got them and never gave them back to me and already got his wet. I've got a few left. Uh, I showed the guys on the trip here. But. Uh, what's the, the doctor in Berkeley? Is that Doc Marston or who who was that? That no, it wasn't Doc Marston. No. I, I wonder who that was. Uh, I had his name until I tried recently to call him, and he's long since uh, probably died or something. Damn. But uh, total loss, total life. We both lost our film. Um, that's and such fine photography. He was the greatest. Uh, how did you come to put a, you used to mount a camera on your helmet. How did that, how, what? Obviously, every riverman's problem is his camera and what to do about it. Uh -huh. So I just figured, well, I'd get it out of the way and use the only tool I had so I wouldn't be bothered with my hands mm -hmm. and put a trigger in my mouth out of a waterproof cover for the camera, which is a movie camera at the time. And it worked fine. I got beautiful shots through, I know they were good, through Badger and Soap and House Rock. I lost it in House Rock. I got good film in House Rock and that last thing bumped me and it went off my, I lost my balance and somehow it got down over my face and I shut it off. So I, I was in action, you know, and I thought, well, the thing will float. It didn't float. Oh, no. I, so I mean, it probably floated, but it was floating so low I couldn't see it in the muddy water. So all that film that you had shot was lost too? Gone. Well, these eight millimeter movies that you were telling us about, do you have a bunch of eight millimeter? Did what? Do you, you were saying that you had a bunch of eight millimeter stuff that you were wanting to transfer. Do, do you well, have a bunch of film that you? Not, I came in the next spring to Phantom and went on down with a new outfit. Still with a camera right on, right on your yeah. helmet. And, and you, uh, I made an excellent series. I lost some of it in the lower end by my own foolishness, but I got about a full reel of the lower canyon, and it's too bad that they didn't have it here, but they gave me two reels. They were supposed to make two copies. So I kept one reel in my box and gave the other one to uh, the boys in the trip here, and, and it turned out to be my slides only. The movies weren't in it. So I told Bob that I'd give him my can with the originals and he could do everything he needed to do with it and then mail it back to me. Yeah, I'd, I'd uh, be real interested to see those, some of those films. I bet you they're great. They, mm -hmm. It sounds like they'd be really good. Oh, he's going to have the originals. Well, I hope he'll take care of them. I'm sure he will.